Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Theo Kerr and um, I know it's been a while since I've uploaded. I've just now finally got back set up, moved in, have a new audio situation here that I'm working on. Um, but all that aside, uh, we're about to start putting out a lot of cool content. And a lot of that content is gonna be Redshift oriented for the time being because of some productions I'm working on and then some personal projects that require it uh, for certain reasons we'll get into later on in the video. Uh, but I want to kind of post about those and share those project files with y'all. So I wanted to kind of introduce everyone to Redshift, especially if you're an Octane user, you're gonna find this video really helpful or if you're coming for cor Corona, uh, any kind of other GPU or even Corona CPU based render engine, you're gonna find this video helpful because I kind of know um, a little bit about all of those render engines so I can kind of relate things over. This is really something I would have wished someone would have done for me because there's a lot of similarities and uh, you don't really see them at first, but once you see them, you're like, oh, this is not that hard to switch over. Uh, a lot of productions are using Redshift now, so I feel like if you get it in your arsenal, at least you can at least download the demo version. You can have the demo version for free on your computer indefinitely, so you can at least learn it and dive into the software. And I think it's never a bad thing to learn another piece of software. I think it can only broaden your horizons and uh, give you more creative options. So with all that being said, uh, let's jump right in. Okay, so for this video, I'm gonna assume that you don't know how to use a render engine at all, but uh, like I said, for the Octane users, Kroner users, Arnold users, I kind of relate things over to that as well. So we're just gonna go over the full basics, um, everything from start to finish. I think the best place to start is the IPR. So let's go to the render viewport. So after you install in Cinema 4D, you'll see this red Redshift render view and it pops up right there. And I always like to, uh, I like to put on my second screen, but for this video, I'm gonna just keep it here so y'all can see everything that I'm seeing. And there we go. So this is the basics of Redshift, uh, the Redshift viewer, and I'm gonna jump, um, I'm just gonna put a cube into our scene, and then I'm gonna go over to our standard settings and go over to Redshift. And don't worry, we'll go over all these settings, but right now, what I want you to do, if you're following along, is just go over to GI and do brute force, and then a radiance point cloud and uh, go ahead and punch play on the render and you'll see that cube pops up right there. We already got something going on. And then let's just go over to lights and just create a area light. And the reasons I like to use area light is because it's the most realistic uh, simulation of a light uh, in the real world, the fall off and everything. So I usually stick with area lights and kind of see, there we go. And then we'll just go ahead and pull this light off to the side just so y'all can see uh, everything. And let's go ahead and create a redshift material. And all you need to do is to go to create redshift material, just like that, and then drag it on over to the cube. And then we gave our red, our material, our cube properties. You can double click that for the node editor and we'll go over that later on. But let's first just focus on the IPR, uh, which is really important. Uh, it's kind of understanding the program. So let me just jump right here and add in a plane. <clears throat> Just so we can see the shadows and everything catching. Very cool, awesome. So uh, we'll go ahead and assign the same material to that plane right there. Great, so <clears throat> we're gonna start off really basic and work our way more advanced. So if you know a little bit about Redshift, you can skip forward. Uh, but for time being, let's just go ahead and just go over the basics. This is the region view right here, Octane users, pretty much similar to Octane. Um, and I will say there's this bucket render right here and you can kind of, <clears throat> if I zoom in some, I'll make this bigger for y'all to see. You see, if you click it right here, this will give you your final render view. When you start optimizing your scene or when you wanna start seeing how stuff will look final output, that's when you wanna do bucket. If you're just look deving, move, playing around, moving around your scene, you just wanna keep the bucket view off because it's way faster, you can see right here. And if we turn the bucket view on, no response. Uh, so keep that bucket view off until you start optimizing your scene. And we'll go over that as well. Uh, but for now, we're gonna leave it off right there. You can also take snapshots. So we can take snapshots and then let's get a different angle, take another snapshot. And then you can click on your snapshots and compare them 
together, which is really nice because you can store multiple snapshots. I really like that feature about Redshift. I hope Octane gets that update soon. As far as I know, you can only do A-B comparison in Octane. So uh, that's something really cool about Redshift that I like. Uh, there's also these freeze geometry, freeze tessellation. This will come in handy when you start displacing objects, especially scenes with a lot of geometry. It'll take a long time to update. You're going to want to do that. Uh, right now, the progressive render is doing just fine without that. Um, so there we go. So I dropped in a redshift light earlier. And let's just go over the basics of this redshift light. And if you understand this one, you'll get the hang of the other ones because they are very similar to other render engines. So here we go. First we have mode, we have color, so we can just choose a color for our light. Very cool. Uh, and if you don't like that, you can do temperature, same concept in octane, and then temperature and color, which is a fusion of the two, and you can get some interesting results. Maybe you just want to shift around a current, a certain color spectrum. You can go choose that spectrum, then shift the temperature of that spectrum. Uh, really nice. Uh, if you're using gels on production and stuff, and you're trying to match the lighting, that color will come in really nice for that. There's also intensity multiplier. And then exposure. So now we're clipping. I like to usually mess around with intensity multiplier before I mess around with exposure. Uh, that's just me. We also have decay types, inverse squared. That is actually how light behaves in the real world. So we usually want to keep that, but you can see none and then linear. So yeah. Um, inverse square, you usually want to stick with that. Another cool thing is, let's just pull the light in. So unlike Octane, uh, Redshift usually just starts off with uh, an invisible light. And you can make your lights invisible in Octane, but Redshift just starts with them. So you have to say, hey, I want this light to be visible right here. So now I'll rotate it some. Cool, and you can see the light uh, right there. So that's our light uh, and we can change also since it's visible now we can see we can do a mesh and then we define a mesh uh, inside of Cinema 4D. We can do a cylinder which is fun, a sphere, a disc and a rectangle which is where we're at. And I usually like to keep it at uh, keep it a rectangle because I notice especially if you do a mesh your sample rates have to be higher. Uh, there's more noise introduced for some reason and that's just with my personal experience. So I usually like to stay with a uh, rectangle and uh, I, I sometimes use these other lights as well especially if you're trying to match production light uh, but a mesh is pretty difficult and it'll require higher sample rate so consider that if you're on a deadline change the size of it uh, but you know nothing new there and then also you can change the spread which is really cool again for matching those production lights if you have a halogen light and uh, the barn doors are really close together then you're going to want to bring this spread down a little bit cool and this is just the basics of it this is only under general though uh there's other things ray uh which i very rarely use volume we'll get into that light group um that's for defining different uh multi for multi passes you can define a light group uh catching shadows a photon this is really cool for uh caustics I've actually used that a couple times, and uh, the caustics are so fast inside of Redshift, uh, which is really cool. Um, but you gotta, you have to kind of uh, do a little bit of research on caustics. I could do a video about it later, but um, they can produce a lot of noise if you're not using the right settings, and that's kind of the whole thing behind Redshift is it's, it's definitely way faster than Octane, um, but you got to use the right settings for it, and it should be because we're biasing calculations here, um, so that's just to be expected. Let's pull this back some. And uh, I get a lot of people saying, oh, Octane's, o Octane and Redshift really aren't that different, guys. Um, as we dive into the settings, we can just do that right now. Um, we have the same concepts here. It's just Redshift makes you kind of dive in a little bit more and really optimize stuff if you want to, um, instead of just pulling the samples up, which is right there. like. Uh, Unified sampling that's a little bit like Octane's adaptive sampling, except it performs way better. Uh, I will say that Denoiser and Redshift is not even close to Octane's AI Denoiser, um, but usually you don't have to end up doing it because you get some crazy uh, fast results out of this. So let's just, um, we'll talk about this later after we build a scene, but just to let you know, you can override your samples here as well as in the settings of your light. 
Cool. Um, let's go ahead and pop in a Redshift camera. And there's two ways you can do that. You can do just a regular camera or just do Redshift standard camera. We'll snap to the view right here. Awesome, so now we're on our camera. Uh, okay, so obviously Cinema 4D, you change all of this stuff. You define everything about the camera here. Uh, but when you click on your camera tag, that's when you get into the Redshift settings. So I'm gonna assume y'all kind of know about the Cinema 4D stuff. Uh, bokeh, there we go. This is a, I really don't like the way they execute this because I'm not, I don't I really understand uh, how this is going to be matched, how you match this with production cameras. Like, for example, it's called the Circle of Confusion, COC. Uh, I like that, it's funny, whatever. Uh, but um, I really need to be able to match production cameras and pr match production apertures. So I really, you're just guessing here. Uh, see, uh, so you're just guessing. And you can pick focus right here. And let's just do focus object. Maybe COC actually stands for something else. I don't know. Uh, cool. Okay, so let's drag our cube. Okay, so go to the camera. And then just under the camera tag, object, drag the cube. And our cube should be in focus, except um, it's gonna focus in the center of the object. In this case, our COC is too high, so we're not even gonna get it in focus because the depth of field is so short. Uh, but now you can start to see that fall off and we can pull it up a little bit more. Yeah, so you can start to see it happening. So play around with that if you want. Uh, I really wish that, I like Octane's implementation where they have the aperture radius and f-stop uh, because that is actually really important for matching production. And I'm not sure if there's like some kind of translation for all of this. They do have this, which is nice. You can also use uh, bokeh images, get some cool effects out of that. Um, play around with it if you want. Uh, if not, that's totally cool. Let's just go ahead and just turn that back off. Uh, distortions, you can add uh, distortions like chromatic abbreviation, uh, color management, you can override this. And let's say if you want a linear output, there you go. Uh, we're gonna go back to sRGB, add in your own LUTs, your own color controls. And remember, you always have to override these things. They are as well here in the settings right here, but that's gonna change your overall project. This is just changing this one camera. Uh, exposure and this is not changing this is kind of a little upsetting but this f-stop just changes the exposure it doesn't change the actual f-stop so keep that in mind vignette um, all of these things uh, they're just they're just effects and ISO it's not gonna actually add more noise and the shutter time is not gonna add more motion blur so keep that in mind bloom here we go yes yeah, so you can see you change the threshold change the intensity cool stuff I'm um, just going over everything for y'all. Okay, I really like this, and Octane does need this, is adding flares. Uh, and it'll be cool if we can get a more realistic flare calculation. I'm not sure how they're doing this, but if they could eventually incorporate like shutter and stuff, uh, that'd be nice. But yeah, that is super awesome. Streak, I'm, at, I'm talking to y'all like y'all are the developers. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, streak, you know this from Octane. Uh, yeah, so the C guys, there's similar concepts here. Okay, so now that we've gone over the camera, we're just gonna go ahead and start diving into some more advanced things, and that's gonna include the note editor. So I think that the note editor is um, probably the uh, most complicated thing about the program, at least for me. So uh, why not go ahead and start teaching it? So let's see. Let's just pull this over because we're not gonna need the render view as much. And I'm gonna actually just use a Quixel Megascan asset for this because I like how they organize their materials. And there's some tricks you can do to where you don't even have to necessarily um, mess with the node editor for importing materials and stuff. Quixel will do it automatically for you, which is a, a big time saver. But in the beginning, I do encourage you to actually plug them in yourself and learn so that you know how to uh, how the node system works because then it'll, it'll allow you more opportunities in the future. So let's just do this. Let's do redshift light area light. Very cool. Okay. And let's just pull it back. Yeah, so if you're following along, if you have Quixel subscription, go ahead and grab an asset. You can grab the same one I'm grabbing if you want or uh, really just any kind of um, any kind of assets will work as long as they have the base properties of a CGI material. 
All right, so let's just go to the acquired. And I'm gonna do a statue here, and that's for a couple of reasons. It's a little bit simpler at first, and then we're gonna do a more advanced material later on. Cool, so we're just gonna, I'm just gonna drag this over here so you can see it. And yeah, there we go. And I'm just gonna pull in our statue. Awesome, and Cinema 40 always pops it into a new project. So we'll just go back to the other one, paste that statue in there. There we go. And uh, just position it. And trying to get the render view to look right. I'm gonna move this over here for y'all. And then I'm gonna change the settings up here. If you change your output settings, weird glitch right there. Uh, if you change your output settings, we can do something like uh, 1500, I think should be good. Yeah, there we go. So now y'all can kind of see what's happening in the viewport a little bit easier. Very nice. Um, we'll get an angle like this for now. And we're gonna take this plain material off and let's just take the other material that we created earlier. And if not, you can just create another one and drop it on to our uh, statue. So now that we have it on our statue, let's go ahead and open it up. And let's actually start using the node editor or the shader graph. Um, I have a lot of things to say about it. First off, this is this needs some updates. Uh, they need to get some Octane's node system. I think it's superior usability-wise. I think you have more options and flexibility here, but I definitely think that the node system side Octane is way more user-friendly. If you're just starting off, the node system is usually the most complicated thing. Uh, so, dragging our albedo, which is right there and then drag in your displacement, drag in your normal, and drag in your roughness. Um, and you notice some materials have AO, which is ambient occlusion. We'll talk about that later. They'll actually plug into your albedo, which is your color. So let's just get these lined up like this. Uh, this looks pretty good. So the first thing we're gonna do is just go here, pick whip it over, RS material. Oh, missed it. RS material right there. Base property diffuse, diffuse color. And you can see now we have a color on our statue, which is pretty cool. And I'll just move this over here so y'all can kind of see it happening in real time. There we go. Okay, so now our normal, our roughness. We'll start with our ref roughness, go to our roughness, and make sure you're in base properties reflection. That's very important. You can go over and click reflection, roughness. There you go. Now our statue has a roughness to it. And then our normal is interesting. I believe in Octane you can just plug it right in. Uh, but here, you actually want to get a bump map. And you're going to take the normal, drag it into the bump map, do texture input, drag the bump map into RS material, and go to overall bump input. But this is not a bump map, you might be asking or saying or yelling at the screen, this is a normal map. Uh, well, that's okay because Redshift has kind of phased out the normal map a node and it's just turned into bump map. So what we do is we'll just go here and you see this setting right here, this is height field. Um, that's for bump maps. We're using a tangent uh, space normal. So we're gonna click that. And there you go. Look at those shadows, uh, look so nice. So now we're gonna drag in our displacement and much like Octane, you're just gonna take your displacement node or like that and plug it in. Texture texture map and I'm sure uh, I've never used red I've never used Corona's or Arnold's um, node editor but I've heard Arnold's very similar and uh, I don't know much about Corona but I kind of think that all these programs are pretty similar so hopefully you're able to follow along, follow along if you're from these render engines so we have our displacement running into RS displacement you see we have scale height field all these things uh, you can do vector displacements which is kind of crazy uh, but for now we're just doing a red shift displacement Output. So instead of going into the material, which you might think, and what I was trying to do at first, you go to the output, because this is the surface. Go to displacement. Awesome, and you might notice nothing happened. Um, if you're an Octane user, that's a little strange. Usually it happens right away. Uh, this is because you need to actually define this as an object for Redshift to displace. So just keep that extra step in mind. Go to Redshift tags right here and redshift object. Just by left clicking, you can get there if you don't know that. Great. So now we have our redshift object. We have all these cool things that we can do. I think you can catch shadows and stuff with these, which is really nice. Uh, but really, mainly what we're gonna do is focus now 
on just the geometry, click override, and let's take a snapshot before we do that, just so you can see. I love the snapshot feature, always using it. And then we'll go over, you can test light your object if you want. Kind of see, smooths it out a little bit. Uh, but let's do displace. And you can see right there, it's displaced our object. And you can enable tessellation, like I said, it'll kind of smooth everything out. You can define minimum edge lengths if you can like to. Don't go too low with that, guys, because that will like completely blow out your scene. Um, and you can also, if you notice right here, displacement. So update, there you go. Uh, just by changing the scale here. Don't change, I tried doing this too because I used Octane. Don't change your displacement here. This really doesn't do much. Uh, you want to be changing it here in your object tag. Uh, so yeah, Octane users, keep that in mind. If you have maximum displacement, displacement scale, you know, you just kind of want to just play around with those and just get the look that you're going for. Um, it's really just one of those things you just play around with on your scene and see how it looks. Cool, so we have this statue. Let's rotate a little bit. Oh yeah, and we're still on the snapshot, so we wanna get off of that. Uh, don't forget to do that. And now it's preparing in our scene, tracing it now. And yeah, we're getting some cool looks off this uh, statue. So uh, you learned how to create a redshift material. Congratulations. Let's, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper and we'll just play around with some nodes just so y'all know that they're there. Um, and at first you don't have to know everything, but there's some cool nodes that I want to mention. And one of them is the curvature node, which is like the dirt node in Octane. Whoa, we got some crazy typing here. And I think if you just type curvature, there we go. Uh, so we have our redshift curvature node, which is really cool. And then we can also get like a composite node. And we have a base color, which would be this and then a blend color. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily use this for curvature. Uh, if we go over to color, I can actually show you the proper node, uh, but keep this node here because we'll be using it later on for other things. So let's just go into our color. And then, so we have, you can see all the options here. Just kind of look at them, color mix. That's the one. So our mix amount will be our curvature. And then our input node one, in their input node two, let's just grab a noise. So let's go here to redshift uh, noise. I always type in RS noise, uh, right here, noise. Uh, it's called RS noise, I don't know why it doesn't come up. And let's just pull this mix out right here. I hope this doesn't look too confusing. I'll get this composite out of there just for now. So y'all can kind of just see everything. So this RX color mix will plug into our diffuse color. And nothing's happening right now because we don't we're not overlaying colors yet. I, something I do like about this is you can take an individual no, node like noise and plug it into your surface. So we'll let that update, and we can see okay our noise is a little too small. Um, it needs to be or it's a little too big. It needs to be scaled down. So let's first change the complexity up super high, and then we can go to the scale and kind of just scale it around. Uh, coordinates, let's see, we can do 40, 40, 40. Yeah, okay, now we're getting a little bit more advanced uh, noise, overall scale. And yeah, we're just playing around with it a little bit. Uh, we can change the comp complexity again, just so y'all can see that. Uh, distortion, different things. Uh, and another cool thing we can do, let's like, for example, this noise, uh, let's take a ramp which I love this node, you'll end up using it a lot, especially if you're blending texture. So let's plug it into the ramp and let's, um, I have a key program for this. If you punt, for me, it's shift A, it will automatically plug that into the output, which is really cool. Uh, so I recommend you getting it, making a hotkey for that because then you can just quickly shift A and get everything. Okay, here we go. So now we're getting some noise. We're just clamping the values, adding some contrast. And then let's grab the curvature and this whole color mix, punch shift A. Yeah, so now we're just blending these together and let's drop this in right there. And if everything is done correctly, let's shift A the curvature. Okay, 
So yeah, we can kind of see our curvature is a little too crazy. So let's just change some of these uh, settings about it. So you can go to the radius right here. And you can go to concave. And kind of just do convex. There's different types of algorithms for this. And this is how you would add dirt onto a material. Very cool. Okay, so now let's take our noise again. Just play around with that. Now that we have our noise, let's shift A that again. Okay, very cool. You can go ahead and let's just take this out now. We can take a, another redshift. I'm just kind of going over everything for y'all, just so y'all know uh, material. So we can just take a material right here and plug it into our input two. And then we're just blending these two materials together now and shift A so we can see everything. Cool. Uh, so let's go back to our curvature node. And you can just kind of see just by playing around a little bit, we're able to get some different looks and some just different lighting and variation on our statue. Uh, this is not a great explanation of uh, the color nodes and everything, but I just kind of wanted to introduce y'all into a little bit because later on we'll be compositing uh, multiple layers on top of each other and uh, I can open up some project later on if we have enough time uh, for that. But there's the basics of the node editor, which is really cool. Um, let's go ahead and let's just take this color mix out, this rich material, this ramp. We'll take this all back out and then we'll take our out color Plug it back in, remember, diffuse, diffuse color. And really guys, when you first start using the node system, just memorize this pattern uh, right here. And, oh yeah, and it'll always turn red when there's no material identified. So if something's turning red for you, it means something's not hooked up right in the node editor. So keep that in mind. Cool. Um, so I've talked about the node editor. Let's talk a little bit about volumetrics, which is one of the reasons I love using Redshift. They have uh, some crazy fast volumetric calculations. I'll get into further videos about this, but for now, let's just create a Redshift environment. And we're just gonna go over to Redshift, Objects, and Environment. I really like environments, uh, just side talk real quick. I like environments a lot, because usually, no matter what's happening, light is being scattered through uh, some type of atmosphere no matter where you are um, even in this room right now there's light passing through atmosphere so I always like to add a little bit of atmosphere if the project permits it um, so here we go this is where that bias stuff comes in guys um, Redshift is known for being a biased render engine so we have to actually tell the light uh, the light so we have our environment right here you see our scatterings at 0.01 actually tell the light here and if you go to the volume tab under the light we have to say hey you need to contribute to the scattering and if we turn it up it's crazy scattering uh, way too much so you really want to go low with this and 0.01 something like that looks good and then we'll go back to our environment and say okay this environment's way too thick for what we want we'll take that down and you can give it a tint which is uh, similar to octane so yeah, we've got these contrasting colors now. Uh, I'm just gonna make it the regular color. I like to change my light colors most of the time. You can also add fog, which is not uh, the same. It's not a, actually a calculation. It's just like an overlay, basically. It's not as advanced as uh, the uh, volume scattering. So yeah, keep that in mind. I usually like to stick with this. Uh, and let's just take a take a view of the scattering. Uh, we've got a, that's a really cool look right there. You see the light kind of just scattering out. Guys, you can see how fast this is calculating. And uh, if I, this is just 1080 Ti, or just 1080, not, not even Ti. And I'll do the bucket render and you can see, did it pretty fast. This is a little noisy. Uh, and eh, it's, it's probably a good time to talk about that a little bit. Let's go into the Redshift settings right here. Okay, so um, this will take some time uh, for you to get the hang of. But uh, just remember, we always want to start with the Brute Force GI. Uh, and I always use Brute Force GI and Radiance Point Cloud for my uh, two primary and secondary GIs. It's kind of the standard. Play around if you want. Uh, I encourage that as always. 
So we're gonna change to a number of rays. We're at 16 right now. This is where that snapshot feature comes in clutch. We'll take a snapshot so we see our noise. We're gonna go over to the number of rays and just go up to like, let's say 128. And then we're gonna let that update. And you might have noticed, we'll take another snapshot. Not sure if this will show up on YouTube compression or not, uh, but it cleaned up our noise way higher. Uh, or there's way less noise. Um, and there's an incorrect way to do this, by the way, guys. And that would be going over here and just changing your samples max up all the way. You wouldn't do it at the very end. Unless you have something like a depth of field and your depth of field is blurry or your depth of field is noisy, then you wanna change your sample max. But uh, for this, you're not gonna to wanna to do that. You're gonna to wanna to change your samples max at the very end. Uh, so let's go back. 128, let's try 512 and see if that changes anything. I always like to go up as high, uh, as clean as I can get it, and then kind of work my way back down uh, depending on what the production will allow and uh, how, how much time I have to render is the most important thing. So yeah, these GI, uh, this Brute Force GI, what we're doing is we're just cleaning up the noise and the shadows and it looks like it got a little bit better. Yeah, and this is very acceptable. I could go to 1024, but really at that point, you're really, especially if you're uploading to a um, video streaming service, you're not gonna notice the difference. Uh, so yeah, we'll just stick it right there. Or, as always, there's this irradiance point cloud samples and stuff. I never ever have to end up messing with those. So just keep that in mind. You can change your GI bounces as well. I mean, I, I like to do eight, I don't know why. Um, I just feel like it's a good number. I like to keep everything in multiples of eight, by the way, guys. Um, keep that in mind, because we'll get into it, but everything's being divided by everything else with Redshift, and uh, that makes it a little bit complicated. But uh, just keep it in mind, keep the multiples of four, multiples of eight, multiples of 16, you know, binary basically. Uh, so just keep it there and it will make your life a lot easier because when Redshift starts dividing stuff, it'll start cutting samples and stuff and it, it will be, you will, you'll change the setting, but there won't be improvement. It's because it hasn't cut to the next sample threshold uh, of division if you have all these crazy numbers. So yeah, um, there we go. We got our statue. Let's see, we'll take a snapshot and compare the two. So in this case, it looks like that uh, the number of GI bounces did nothing. So we'll go back down to three. There's optimization, there's reflection, refraction, combined transparency, and we can turn up reflection up and we'll see if it does anything. I doubt it will do anything in the scene because we don't have a lot of reflection going on. But usually if you have a statue, especially shiny one, um, or kind of any kind of shiny material that has a lot of crevices It will bounce around a little bit more and brighten it up and make it look way more realistic like there's actually some like Well, it looks like it looks a little more like real life because there's more light bouncing around Let's take a snapshot of that Yeah, so in this case Literally no change at all. So we'll go back down to six And that's kind of into the thing into the line kind of things that you want to mess with um you get diminishing returns as you go up in these numbers. Cool. So this is where you'll spend most of your time, I feel like, um, optimizing everything. And I just want to talk about this a little bit. Um, so this unified sampling is like adaptive sampling. So what it's gonna do, and if we we can click show samples right here, it's gonna re-render. And it looks like in this case, Oh yeah, in this case, it's not gonna do it. Uh, usually what it does is it shows a dark and like a light and it shows where your samples are being focused and we can kind of come back and mess with that. Uh, basically, it's gonna try to focus your samples uh, on certain parts, a lot like Octane's adaptive sampling, except with adaptive sampling and Octane, I noticed displacements would catch a lot of noise and uh, fog would catch a lot of noise and they wouldn't adaptive sample correctly. There'd just be holes in the depth sampling and look weird, uh, almost look like Swiss cheese, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> um, we'll talk about the unified sampling guys, save that for variant, go to sampling overrides. So these numbers are being multiplied and divided by every, um, by each other. So we're gonna be overriding these uh, n numbers up here. I just realized you can't really see my hands. 
we're gonna be overriding these numbers with these sample overrides. So the first thing that I noticed is this volume is really noisy. So we're just gonna click override right now. We're gonna watch our render and let's go ahead and take a snapshot. And really we don't need to even focus on the statue as much. So we'll just take the, and you see why you wanna bug your render at the end because it's a little bit slower. Cool, so we're at eight right now. Let's take a snapshot. And let's just go up, I like to jump up a lot. Let's go 128. Cool, and uh, we cleaned it up pretty good. And let's take another snapshot. So now y'all can see the difference between the two. And I'll zoom in on both of them. So you can see the noisiness of the volume. And then when I go back over, it's cleaned up a little bit, which is nice. Um, there you go. So you can really see uh, what that does. And I think we could go for 256. Again, all these numbers depend on your uh, allotted time for production. Obviously you wanna go high quality as possible, but at the end of the day, you don't wanna be wasting time, wasting energy and wasting uh, money on something that won't be noticed. So yeah, in this case, uh, not sure if YouTube compression is showing it or not, uh, but we have, uh, we have a relatively good cleanup there. So let's just go ahead and render the whole scene, bucket mode, and see what, uh, what, what it looks like. And there we go, take off that. Okay, while that's happening, I'm gonna dive into a little bit of these settings because it'll take a quick second to do that. Um, okay, so we have all of these settings, sampling override, guys, again, mess around with them, take snapshots, see if it makes your scene faster, especially if you're doing a long animation, uh, you're gonna really want these samples to be correct. And keep in mind that this will change from project to project, but usually I end up getting around the same numbers uh, on everything. So here's the denoiser. I don't really mess with these denoising engines. I don't think they're uh, that good. So <laughs> that's just my personal experience with them. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, all of these things, the lens effects, environment, uh, denoising, uh, motion blur is important. You can enable it, I usually would. The way that this is calculated is very weird. There's different ways you can, you can calculate the center of the frame, and I think there's some more options here. Yeah, start, on frame, and on frame. There's probably better explanations on YouTube about this. I usually just do center and frame and leave these settings here. There's different types. You can enable deformation, motion blur, deformation steps, all these things. I like to just leave them stock and it hasn't failed me yet. So if I need to get uh, more information, I'll do some more research on them. But I think for now, I know just enabling it's fine enough for me. Um, sampling overrides, like I said, I'm not a genius at Redshift, but I kind of feel like uh, I know what's going on. You can notice when we see this rendering, this little box, um, you can kind of see how it just skips right through the fog and that's because it's not having to calculate as much um, there because we're overriding for that particular part or that volume uh, and so we had to go all the way to 256 for this volume if we would have done it 256 overall it would have been crazy high uh, it'd be calculating the ambient occlusion the refraction refraction the light everything in 256 we don't need that uh, for this thing cool okay so i see a problem area down here and I think this is gonna be uh, relating to our light. So yeah, and I really hope y'all can see this because uh, this is extreme noise. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and enable our light. Let's take a snapshot and enable our light overrides. Just like that, cool. And there it goes. So we, sh we went to eight um, and let's take another snapshot. And I think this actually should decrease in quality uh, because we dropped it. It was at 16 because we weren't overriding it. Now it's at eight. And yeah, there's not a big difference. Can't really tell. Uh, sure, it could have dropped the quality a little bit, but it's already so low in sample rate. So yeah, we have a lot of noise going on here. Let's fix that. Um, let's go to, and this is a lot of noise. So I'm, gonna think, I'm thinking 256 at least and we'll see what that does. There we go. We cleaned it up really good right there. Let's take a snapshot so you can see the difference. That's horrible. And now 
smooth. Uh, I think this might even need to be 512 to be 100% honest. At this point, I'm being really picky though. 256 would have worked well. Uh, yeah, yeah, that helped a lot. So now that we've done all this, um, there's some other stuff we can do. We can do ambient inclusion, we can do reflection, we can go through all these settings. Um, I wanna kinda jump back over GI and see, uh, instead of cranking up everything crazy high, I wanna see if this GI will kind of, uh, it might be part of the problem. And let's just let it render the bucket mode out. Cool, so Cinema 4D crashed, um, but luckily uh, I had the bug report and I recovered the backup because I'm actually not even saving this project file. I'm just kind of playing around uh, just so y'all can see everything. So we have, uh, like I was talking about earlier, we have a little bit of issues with some noise down here. And like I said, this is just being really picky, guys. Um, this is actually just like a gradient fall off. And uh, what I was going to say is we can go over to our GI right here and let's just change this to 1024, take a snapshot, and let's see if that does anything. So this is changing the amount of GI rays that are being fired from the camera. So just keep that in mind. You're gonna be firing more rays. There's gonna be more calculations involved. It's gonna be a little bit slower. And take that snapshot. So in this case, there's no difference. Let's go back down to 512 then. So we know, whoa, number of rays one, that's gonna be messy. All right, so let's go back down to 512 and then we'll get, uh, we'll go back to our basics right here and start messing with these. Ambient occlusion, it could possibly be that. Let's just do 256. I always like, if I don't know what it is, I always like to go higher on the samples to overdo it just to see if there's a drastic change or not. And let's take a snapshot, I'm not seeing much. Usually, I don't have to end up changing the ambient occlusion. And yeah, no need, so we can just uncheck it. It could possibly be a reflection problem, but and more likely than not, we're just gonna have to change our overall samples higher, which is fine. So let's change our reflection. And yeah, I'm not seeing the cleanup that I was looking for. Yeah, so nothing happened, which is a good teaching moment uh, for everyone watching. So a lot of times what's happening is these numbers are being, as far as I understand, the engine is working by taking these numbers and multiplying it by these numbers right here. So when we increase this number, to something higher is going to higher multiply by a higher number thus resulting in more samples being calculated so let's do something like 64. so we have way more overall samples being calculated uh but as well and i think the issue here is that the light sample rate is not quite high enough yet so i think this is going to bump this light sample rate up higher because they're going to be multiplying and let's zoom in right here and we'll see if my theory is correct Okay, um, looks like we have a little bit of cleanup right here. Yeah, okay, so you can kind of start seeing we're getting to the point where there's just diminishing returns. So yeah, we have a more defined shadow. It's a little bit cleaner, but really overall, is it worth the extra sample? Is it worth extra render time? You can see right here too, some noise is getting cleaned up. Probably not. Uh, you can change your depth of air threshold as well, but honestly, uh, looking at the big picture, this is super picky stuff. Um, when we're viewing this, honestly, even uncompressed, you might not even notice the, smite, uh, the slight changes uh, in the noise pattern, so that's totally fine. We can go higher with our samples, go crazy, but really, with what we're working with, it looks pretty nice. Uh, one last thing we can do, just for fun, just so I can show y'all, we can always change and let's get back out of this. And I usually don't do this, but just for the point uh, of this, 
we'll change to something crazy high and we'll let this render out without us changing it so we can just see the before and after the Radiance Point Cloud, uh, which is our second Dairy GI engine. It's kind of just like rebouncing some stuff, or filling in some uh, shadows. So let's take a snapshot of that and let's do 128 samples per pixel. And we'll see what happens. I'm interested. I love, uh, I love seeing how these things work. Okay, I don't think anything happened. Yeah, I don't see anything. Maybe there's a slight change in the noise pattern. Uh, so that just goes to show you, you don't really need to mess with that. Cool, so we have this cleaned up, super nice. We got a cool image. We can talk a little bit uh, about the output, I mean, just do your regular output, usually 24 frames a second. Select your frame range if you're doing an animation. Uh, okay, I've got a lot of requests on this. We'll be doing a workflow into After Effects. I got a big project uh, that's gonna involve a lot of that coming up, so uh, I'm gonna be learning a lot, and I'll say subscribe to see that stuff. Uh, I'll be helping y'all out with that. So yeah, EXR, that's that's what you wanna render at. Uh, you can do multi-passes. AOVs, that's your multi-pass. Uh, Multi-part EXR, you can select the AOV manager right here and drag in AMI inclusion, custom, caustics and stuff. And then you can go back up here and click, there's your custom, there's your ambient inclusion. Um, yeah, we don't have any ambient inclusion being calculated, so yeah. Um, so yeah, you can throw all that stuff in, render it out separately, composite later in After Effects. And a lot of projects require that. Me personally, I actually just do one pass. Usually it's just the beauty pass. And that's because uh, I have to have a quick turnarounds on some of the stuff that I'm doing. So I don't really want to have to, uh, After Effects kind of slows down with more layers you get. I don't really want to be stacking all this stuff on top of each other, slowing After Effects down, even though it does yield you more control. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Um, yeah, guys, this, this concludes everything. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope that this helped you and there'll be a way more Redshift videos in the future because currently Octane won't open on my computer. It'll only stay like, it, it crashes every 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. And I've tried multiple versions. I've tried reinstalling drivers. I don't know what the deal is right now. So um, I have to like get some of this stuff done. So yeah, that's why I'm doing some stuff in Redshift. So guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, leave them below. Uh, and another thing is like, People tend to freak out, like, oh, Octane Redshift, like, uh, I make some videos of them versus each other. Guys, it's really not that big of a deal. They're just tools at the end of the day. And uh, as artists, we're supposed to select the best tools for us. So just because Redshift is great for me doesn't mean that it's going to be great for you. Uh, but uh, I do recommend it. So with all that being said, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, you can support me in the Patreon for project files below. Uh, you can also check out my website if you want. I got uh, the Octane class. So if you are interested in getting into render engines, let's say you've been using physical for a while in Cinema 4D, or you've been uh, just messing around with Blender, if you want to take it to the next level and actually dive in and learn, uh, definitely go check that out. And I do still recommend Octane to beginners uh, if you don't have anyone to help you along because Redshift has so many settings and it gets really confusing. And I remember in the beginning how confused I was. So it's really nice just to be able to be like, I don't want to worry about the samples right now. I just want to understand the fundamentals. Um, Octane's super great for that. Quick turnaround times. So guys, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and peace out.